Ready? Yep. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Vincent Encomio. I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent for Martin and St. Lucie Counties. I'm here in, here in Martin County in Stewart at the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center. With me is Dr. Glenn Cauldron. He is a research scientist here at, um, at Florida Oceanographic. And we're here on Aqualive. Uh, so this month is Aquaculture Month for uh, Florida Sea Grant. And we're here celebrating all the different things that are going on in Florida that are related to um, supporting a healthy coastal ecosystem and as and and um, sustainable uh, ec economy for our for our communities here in Florida. And one of the things I'd like to talk about, in a, an example of aquaculture that I'd, that I'd love to present to you about, is it's a different kind of aquaculture. So we think of aquaculture as we grow fish uh, for for consumption, for example. This is a different kind of aquaculture in so what we would term this as restoration aquaculture. And what we're, what we're doing here at Florida Oceanographic is we're growing seagrass. We're growing seagrass for eventual habitat restoration. What you see behind me and these tanks are a working seagrass nursery that is an integral part of Florida Oceanographic's mission to um, inspire environmental stewardship locally here in Florida. And the way that we do that is one of the ways that we accomplish that mission here in Martin County is we're growing seagrass here at the Coastal Center. That seagrass, if you can see all the green blades of grass behind me, that seagrass will then be planted in the Indian River Lagoon. And it's particularly important because in the last eight years or so, we've lost an immense amount of seagrass due to a, a number of different reasons, whether that be brown tide in the Northern Lagoon, freshwater discharges and, and turbid water or murky water in the southern Indian River Lagoon. We've lost a lot of seagrass and it's such an important habitat for, for the Indian River Lagoon, which is known as the most biodiverse estuary in North America, home to over 4,000 different species. And many of those species utilize seagrass habitat for habit, habitat and refuge. And many of those fish species also be, grow in at, as babies, they might uh, reside in those seagrass beds, and then they grow to adults, and many of those species are fish that we like to catch and eat. So I'm here with, with Dr. Cauldron, and Glenn, can you tell me a little um, But that's largely a monoculture of seagrass. It's all, you know, very genetically similar. Um, it's uh, very difficult to control what, you know, types of seagrass is in there. So we started this system of tanks where we now have nine tanks and those tanks we can isolate out um, and that allows us to make sure we have a very diverse grouping of seagrass that can be used for restoration. So we're not just planting one specific genetic type of seagrass uh, in our restoration programs. So, so that's an important research project that is ongoing right now at Florida Oceanographic it's in collaboration with the University of Florida as well. Glenn, can you talk about the importance of, of having that genetic diversity, even within one species that we see here, as this is a shoal grass. Um, why is that important? So the, the genetic diversity is really important because although to most people, uh, they're gonna look pretty similar, the different types of genotypes of seagrass, but they have slightly different functions. They act a little bit differently. Um, you know, they might be a little taller or a little shorter, or the leaves might be a little thicker. Or important, just like it is for species diversity, just like one person might be better at doing, say, paperwork, and one person might be better at doing construction of houses. If everyone was just good at building houses, we wouldn't have anyone to do the paperwork for building those houses. So that's what having this diversity of seagrass is for. It sort of heads or bets, covers covers the different scenarios that the seagrass might be in, makes them more resilient to damage and loss, makes better habitat for more types of species to live in those seagrass. So, Great. just like species diversity. Awesome. I liken it to the portfolio concept. If you have an investment portfolio, you want that to be as diverse as possible so it's resilient to any changes in the market. Um, so that, that's the same idea behind having as much genetic diversity when we plant seagrass uh, at those particular restoration sites. And speaking of economic importance, uh, the, the, what 
studies have shown that seagrass beds, I think about up to an acre, is worth maybe anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars. Yeah, depending on what aspect you're looking. Right, for. and and if you think about that, you know how why would an acre or any amount of seagrass have any economic economic value? Well, if you think about if you're a fisherman and you're, you're say you're you want to get some spotted sea trout or red drum. You're, you're coming here to Stewart or, or wherever in the Indian River Lagoon. You're driving here, maybe trailering a boat, purchasing, getting gas for your um, for your boat, getting gas for your vehicle. Um, all of those, all of that is money. Not only is it an economic benefit, it's a local economic benefit. That money is being spent right here in Martin County, in Stewart, or wherever that that fisherman may be within the Indian River Lagoon or anywhere in our coastal waters in, in Florida. And so it's not only an economic benefit, and that's part of what goes into that calculation or, or helps go into that calculation for evaluating different kinds of habitats, but it's also specifically benefiting those local economies. And that's something that is very important to the mission of, of Florida Sea Grant, as well as, as Florida Oceanographic. So um, are we on three more minutes? Okay, well, great. So anyway, um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to touch upon, which is really a really neat story about how this project evolved. Um, Glenn, can you talk about the involvement of the community, particularly this project and this program as a citizen science project? Yeah, so all of this seagrass is um, actually collected by citizens, by the community. Uh, all of the seagrass is through a recycling program. Um, so rather than going out and digging holes, uh, which we these, um, we basically have volunteers that go out and they comb the shoreline and they look for uh, pieces of seagrass that have naturally been pulled up by waves or by boat motors or stingrays. And we plant them in these tanks and we allow them to grow out and basically replicate themselves and grow more seagrass. And so. None of the seagrass damaged any beds to get it. This is all have just dried up and died on shore. Uh, and that's all only possible because of a whole team of volunteers that go out on a regular basis and look over beaches and shorelines and collect that seagrass, bring it back here. And then we have volunteers that come in and every week clean these tanks, get the algae that grows off of them, keeps everything clean, makes everything, make sure everything's healthy. And nice. Great, great. So that's that's a, an example of sort of that interaction between scientists, um, restoration practitioners. We're trying to restore seagrass. Scientists are studying not only how well these are doing in this nursery, but also looking at the genetic diversity and the involvement of the community. All of those things come together to create this this um, this seagrass restoration program. And as an example of, this is w just one example of, of what we would term restoration aquaculture. Throughout Florida, there are other examples of different types of habitat restoration that are going on and utilizing aquaculture technology to aid those efforts. For example, in the Keys and on the west coast of Florida, they're growing corals that will eventually be used to restore the cor uh, reef, coral reefs down in the Florida reef track. They're also growing sponges. That's also happening in the Keys as well. Sea Grant is, is particularly involved in those projects as well. Another aspect of, of an, or an example of restoration aquaculture is, for example, oyster gardening. People are growing oysters off their docks in different areas of Florida. The, the Indian River Lagoon, Florida Oceanographic, one of their first uh, uh, restoration projects was exactly that, an oyster gardening program. Now the Rivard Zoo is doing that up in the northern lagoon, central and northern lagoon, uh, and, and some of that work is also on the west coast as well. So those are just an example of what we would call restoration aquaculture. So I think we're getting close to the end of our introduction. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. Um, if there's a way we can bring the camera just to show a little bit of the So this is all one species of seagrass. It's shoal grass. The species is Halidule ridei. And all of this is very healthy seagrass. And uh, you know, we really, we also got started. Uh, 
Um, one of the ways we got started is when we were collecting seagrass fragments, we would plant them in Florida Oceanographic's Game Fish Lagoon, which is a big uh, outdoor exhibit. It's about 750,000 gallons that house local species of, 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 of fish and invertebrates. And in the back part of the lagoon, which is very shallow, we were planting seagrass just to see how well it would do. And eventually, after multiple plantings, they started to take and they started to get established. And so not only was that the start of a, of a nice little, a really nice restoration program that's, that's very, very much needed, it also was a nice exhibit for the public. And if um, anybody out there that, that comes to Stewart wants to come see, see the, the, the seagrass growing here, uh, please come to the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center. We're on Hutchinson Island here in Stewart. And um, you learn all about the Indian River Lagoon, all the different species that, that grow here, and all the efforts, both not only research, but education and advocacy that Florida Oceanographic is, in, is, uh, is, is currently doing to help improve our, our local coastal resources. Okay, we have our first question. Great. How successful is seagrass replanting in estuaries? I'll let you. Um, that. that very much depends on the method and the estuary. Um, if you're talking about <coughs> some species like Zostra, which occurs up north, it can be extremely successful. Um, here we've had uh, mixed success. Um, at some sites we've had very good success. Uh, some sites closer to periodic outflows from like Okeechobee, uh, it's, it's much more hit and miss. So the research part of that is is not only seeing if the plantings are successful, but also finding those those particular spots that can support that that restoration effort. And we'll probably find different, not only different regions within the Indian River Lagoon. For say, for example, areas that are more distant from the freshwater discharges that we see here down in Martin County, maybe those areas will be uh, better candidates for restoration success. They'll be more buffered from those from those effects or even just maybe even specific sites for whatever reason, it might be the, the landscape of the site itself, the elevations at that particular site, which will, uh, inch, which will uh, we might see better success. The research also comes into play in finding <coughs> ways, even in those sites where the success is not as good, as finding ways to make it better, trying to plant more diverse seagrass or plant it in different ways to try and right. mitigate that loss. Are there other seagrass hatcheries around the state? Are they all with universities, or are there any private hatcheries? Um, well, Florida Oceanographic is a 501c3, so so we're a nonprofit. Uh, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution is starting a seagrass nursery. They they they've kind of just getting that underway. Uh, they're they're with Florida Atlantic University up in Fort Pierce. Uh, the, the Harbor Branch campus is in Fort Pierce. Uh, there is a private company that's developed a nursery on the west coast. I believe they're called Sea and Shoreline. They're mainly growing uh, a freshwater species of, of submerged aquatic vegetation called the American tapegrass or Valisneria americana, which is also very, a very important target for restoration. Uh, and, and I think they're starting to do some saltwater species as well. Beyond that, I can't think of any other. I know DEP in the Panhandle has done some work with a different, another species of, of seagrass called rupia, uh, or um, I think the common name is widgeon grass, I believe. And uh, they've done some restoration work and have developed some facilities to culture that species as well. Beyond that, I... Nothing permanent. No. Um, no, nothing else permanent. No. Right I, the, the one thing that, that I think would be great for any organization to look into is, is these frag, utilizing these fragments, um, uprooted fragments. Normally, to transplant seagrass, you need a special permit to dig it out, move it to an, another area <clears throat> where you're trying to restore from a healthy bed. And you know that creates an impact as well. The nice thing about utilizing these, these naturally uprooted fragments is you, as, as, as Glenn mentioned earlier, you're not impacting an existing bed. So I think that concept is, is very easy to take in different areas of not only the Indian River Lagoon, but Florida and other areas of the country where people are trying to, or, or one of the important concerns is to try to restore 
seagrass or submerged aquatic vegetation is you can utilize what what the I mean the, the most important finding is that you can regrow seagrass from these naturally uprooted fragments and that becomes your starting stock for a restoration program and then having the access to running seawater that's also important as well We've done it at um, four different restoration sites here in the Indian River Lagoon. We've had to go through the permitting process, just like if we were doing oyster restoration or any other habitat restoration that's in uh, submerged or sovereign, what you would call sovereign submerged lands, which are owned by the state. So we have to get permits from uh, DEP, Florida DEP, and the Army Corps of Engineers. So it is, it is kind of a, a, a bit of a process related to that. But for, we've established four restoration sites where we can go back to those sites. That they're, they're not only restoration sites, but they're also test sites where, we're, you know, Glenn had mentioned testing out different techniques, looking at the effects of genetic diversity on restoration success. So we, we have that, that permit for the next several years and we can renew it. And, um, and then hopefully what we're, what we're also trying to do is expand the number of sites. Unfortunately, we do have to go site by site and, and get permits uh, for either one or just a few sites at a time. So that's, that's one thing that lengthens that process out to really expand. We don't have any really, really large scale, multiple acres uh, uh, restoration sites at this time. But they're also, the restoration sites are small, are small plots, but the other thing that's nice about and it relates to this community-based restoration concept, is we're working with a lot of private homeowners to establish ha habitat restoration uh, along their waterfront, their, sh their, their waterfront properties. And the seagrass actually is a component of Florida Oceanographic's Living Shoreline Program. And included with that are also oyster reefs and where possible shoreline plantings as well. So we're, we're engaging the community to to, for their support in that effort, which, which includes the seagrass restoration. Alrighty, are there monitoring efforts for outplanted areas monitoring success? Yes, in fact, uh, this past year, Slower Oceanographic has been, has been monitoring some of their plantings from this year that they did in the spring, and then also uh, the previous, previous couple years. So, so yeah, that's actually uh, an important component of, of the, the research and restoration that goes on here. And it's also a requirement for, for those permits as well. And how complicated is the permit process? Um, it's, it's not that complicated, it's more lengthy. So you, we have to submit, we can submit a single application to DEP. They send that application to the Army Corps of Engineers. They have to review both both agencies, state and federal, have to review it. If they if they have if there's some concerns or if they need some questions answered, they'll they'll send us. Um, uh, it'll, it's called an RAA document, and it's a request for additional, which stands for a request for additional information. They'll have specific questions. We'll provide that information to to satisfy or to, or to answer those questions, and then it's this sort of back and forth process until we get to the point where we've. We've satisfied all the concerns, and then then it's a matter. Then it's processing that application. I would say the current seagrass permit we're under. It was about six months to get that from DEP from the state, and another couple months to get that from the Army Corps of Engineers. So anywhere from six to eight months. That was just for the seagrass alone. And is this something that should be done in residential? Uh, you know, oftentimes the bathymetry of a canal probably wouldn't support uh, uh, seagrass, even if, it, if it's in salty water, uh, it, it might be too deep. There's also issues of turbidity um, in those canals. Um, even if the water quality on its own, salinity, uh, it, for example, would be adequate. Uh, turbidity is, is an important uh, component of that. So we're, we're doing all of our restorations in pretty shallow water, certainly about three feet or less in, in, in depth. Uh, the other thing is, is, habit, is setting, is the, or the sediment, um, sediment that's found in those canals. If it's, a, if it's just a 
sort of a square or rectangular bottom, you don't really have any any shoals or, or, or adequate sediment to plant. Um, I don't know if there's anything. This large water depth, water clarity, even just the turbulence from boat motors going through there is going to stir up what sediment is there. So even if it's sometimes clear water, when boats go through, it's not going to be clear. So if it's frequently used, you're going to have a lot of problems with water clarity and just not going to get enough light to that seagrass, even if there is room to plant it at the bottom of those, the bottom of those channels. In actual different species or within intraspecific? In, intra um, or interspecies? So between species. species. Oh, between species interactions. Um, not not to my knowledge or, or exactly well studied. <laughs> not really, because seagrass genetics are still. Developing, so there's only a few species at a time that are even getting in the work done. Okay, so, so, so go, ahead, go ahead. So the short answer is basically <clears throat> seagrass genetics is still very early uh, on in the process. A lot of species <clears throat> don't have genetic testing <clears throat> techniques worked out yet. Um, so there's only a few species that the genetics can even be looked at comprehensively. Maybe in five years. So that, yeah, that's a question for a few years from now, hopefully. I don't know if you all could hear that, but in the background is Dr. Katie Tyling. Katie's been sick. She's lost her voice. She is our seagrass expert, uh, the seagrass expert here at Florida Oceanographic. And um, and though, although Glenn, between the two of us, we 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 know enough, but really, she is the star of this program. So um, so that that was a that was a t particularly tough question, but thankfully we've got. We've got Dr. Tyling here to help with us, help us with that one. So, in general, the genetic uh, genetics of seagrass, of different seagrass species, is is really sort of in its incipient stages in terms of understanding all of that. So, yeah. What is known is that at le at least intraspecific diversity or genetic diversity within a species, say whether it's shoal grass or some some nice studies were done with um, eelgrass. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Laura Reynolds at University of Florida. There was eelgrass, is that correct? Yeah. So Dr. Laura Reynolds, who's the collaborator on this project, she's also one of the one of U University of Florida and Florida Sea Grant scientists that that has done a lot of work on genetics and seagrass. She's collaborating with this pro on this project with the Florida Oceanographic Society. She's done some really nice work looking at the influence of intraspecific genetic diversity of um, eelgrass. And on its um, on the success uh, on the restoration success of, of, of that particular species. And is this being looked at for both east and west coast restoration? Um, I believe now. Now, is the question regarding genetics or just restoration on its own? I would go restoration. Restoration. <clears throat> As far as I know, on the West Coast, um, there are there is a, a there's a there's a number of different groups that are doing. Uh, I mentioned another species, Valisneria. There's a, a, a some groups doing that uh, on the West Coast in the Clusahatchee River or water bodies around that area in, in the Lee County area. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, for example, has been doing that. A few private companies uh, have been doing that type of um, restoration. Uh, for example, sea and shoreline. As far as saltwater submerged aquatic vegetation for seagrass, the, the main thing that I know about is the DEP group up in the Panhandle with uh, widgeon grass or Rupia maritima. Um, but as far as shoal grass um, or uh, say turtle grass and uh, some of the other um, species, seagrass species that you might that you might that you find in Florida, like manatee grass. Uh, as far as I know. Um, not not much or n nothing, nothing that I'm aware of. Nothing large scale. Not, or, and nothing large scale. Okay, and then can you guys talk a little bit about the citizen science component of this project and how, how can people get involved? 
Um, so one of the ways that, that people can get involved is, is particularly if you live in this area, if you live in, in Martin and St. Lucie counties, uh, in, along the Treasure Coast, you can uh, contact Florida Oceanographic, contact Dr. Coldren, contact Dr. Dr. Tyling, and what they, the, the first thing, the, the other thing I mentioned about the citizen science that, that, or one thing I forgot to mention about the citizen science is that not only are they participants, but they're also getting educated. Uh, so, so what Dr. Tyling does is when she gets enough interested uh, participants, she'll host a workshop teaching people how to identify different seagrass species where to look for it, how to identify a condition of an uprooted fragment that is that would be most amenable to replanting or, or, or reviving in, in this seagrass nursery. And so those, those citizen scientists get to learn about not only how to identify seagrass, they get to learn about seagrass ecology. So that would be the first step is, is reaching out to Florida Oceanographic the, and participating in one of those seagrass workshops and then what they what we do is send you out with a little kit. It's really a bucket identification card, um, some note cards to be able to record where you're collecting seagrass. That's very important, the date and time and, and location. And then you and then you would uh, that particular person would come to the coastal center and drop off those fragments. So that's one way to, to get started. Other area other um, areas within Florida. Um, the, I think one way to get started is, is um, contact uh, other scientists in that area. So, so some, uh, some of our uh, Florida Sea Grant uh, extension agents and, and scientists to see if maybe it's possible to start uh, a, a restoration program, if it's if a citizen science-based restoration program, if it's, if it's needed, uh, some of the universities uh, or other nonprofits. And it, it, and then they, they, those groups can reach out to, to Florida Oceanographic here about, about getting started. Okay, it looks like someone might have just jumped in. Um, they're asking how and when can we attend the Seagrass workshop and reaching out to you at SLS. So um, keep, uh, keep an eye out. Again, uh, Dr. Tolling doesn't schedule those until she has enough participants. Uh, so, so keep an eye on, on Florida Oceanographic's calendar on their website, which is uh, uh, floridaocean.org, or friend them on Facebook. And then you'll, you'll find out those announcements. You can contact Dr. Tiling directly, uh, ktiling, T-I-L-I-N-G, at floridaocean.org. And then uh, what she'll do is, is kind of keep a list of, of interested people, and once she gets enough people, she'll, she can schedule a workshop. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you out there, out in the Facebook Live land, and uh, hope this was informative. And look, uh, keep an eye out for the next uh, Florida Sea Grant Facebook Live Aqua Live presentation. That'll be the first Friday of every uh, no every Friday. I'm sorry, every Friday uh, of of this month. Sorry about that. Great.